So we are now continuing chapter three. As mentioned earlier, chapter three is a very, very long chapter. Um, it's going to take us many lessons to finish uh, with Hashem's help. I just want to recap where we were. We were discussing prefaces, um, ideas that are, are foundational ideas, and the first preface was actually a recap of the seven qualities that one needs in order to be trustworthy that we learned about in chapter two. So um, we just did that. And then we were mentioning how Hashem is totally in control in a unique way, unlike any other power in, in creation. Um, and we were saying that the way that Hashem runs the world is this, you know, complex system of causes and causes of causes and causes of causes and causes of causes of causes of causes, of causes right? Okay. That's what we were just saying. Now, Rebbeinu B'chai is going to continue on that, um, on that note and, and, and explain a little bit more about Hashem's total control and how really nothing in creation has anything like that type of control or power or influence at all. And he explains it with some philosophical reasoning, with some logic. Um, much of what Rabbeinu B'chaya says in this next little section here, this next little part of chapter 3, is very, very similar to some ideas that are expanded upon in Chsidis. Although Rabbeinu Bachaya uses the Lashon of Chakira, the, the philosophical language and terminology and ideas. So I want to sort of go into this and fill it in or, or, or maybe just translate it to um, some of the parallel Hasidic ideas. So they're not even parallel ideas. They're the same ideas, but the way that it's brought out in, in, in Chassidus, which is uh, more metaphysical or, um, well, you'll see. Okay. So we were talking about the way Hashem is in complete control, total control, um, and uses causes of causes of causes in order to get things done, but it's all under his control. Okay. A person who does not understand the matters of this world is going to think. Okay, here's the setup. Someone who doesn't understand how the world works is going to have the following erroneous understanding of things. Um, it's interesting that, at least to me, this is very similar to a, an argument that the al Rebbe in Tanya sets forth, specifically in Shara Yechad Ve'amuna, Perek Base, the second chapter, which we had recently in Chitas, actually, uh, as well as in Igeras HaKedish Simen Chof, letter 20. There's actually a whole long stretch of Shari Yechod Ve'amuna Perek Base, which is identical, ver almost verbatim, to a, a, a long part of Igeras HaKedish Simen Chof. Um, and it's about the misunderstanding that the philosophers have. In one place he calls them the philosophers, in another place he calls them the, the, the heretics. But it's a misunderstanding about the nature of reality. Um, and the, the misunderstanding is based upon, it's very similar to what Rabbeinu Bechai is saying right here. He, he says people who don't know how the world works, okay? But what's, what's the, the common denominator there? That they don't understand that the way Hashem makes the world is not comparable to human creativity. They're used to thinking of creativity in terms of human creativity, which is not creation at all, but formation. The human creator, when he expresses himself or she expresses herself creatively, isn't actually making something from nothing, but rather manipulating the form of things that already exist. I believe, uh, maybe even in the last lesson, 
I, I told you the, the Carl Sagan Vort. And uh, since it's a great one, I'll say it again. You know, I told you, I, yeah, I remember because I told you about the Cosmos, the, the old show, the Cosmos back in the 70s. I remember quoting Carl Sagan. And I told you, he said, What's, what are the instructions for baking an apple pie from scratch? First, create the heavens and the earth, right? Because if you already have heavens and the earth, you're not really creating from scratch. You already have raw materials. From scratch means you have no raw materials. You're starting from absolute nothing, just like God did when he, when he created. So, and, and actually, just like God is doing as he creates right now, he's also creating something from absolute nothing. And, and, and the reason is because um, when a human being manipulates the form of one something into another something, in Shari Yichud Vemona Perek Beis and in Igeras HaKadosh Shemen Chof, he uses the, the metaphor of a silversmith. So he changes, he manipulates the form of a, of a hunk of silver and makes it into a beautiful cup. And then he leaves it on the shelf in the workshop and he goes out for lunch. And while he's out for lunch, there's no danger that the cup's going to revert to its former shape. Uh, because, after all, the only thing he's done to it has changed its, its form, which is a rather minor change. It's only a superficial change. As opposed to what? What would not be a minor or superficial change? Well, overriding the essence of something would, be, uh, would not be minor or su superficial. What does it mean to override the essence of something? Well, you know, nothingness. What is nothingness? And I apologize, by the way, if this is very deep, but... Uh, okay, you can change the channel on me. All right. Um, nothingness is pretty much defined by its non-existence. That's pretty much the definition of, non, of, of nothingness. So turning nothingness into somethingness isn't a minor change or a change of its form or superficial qualities or secondary characteristics or however you want to say it. It's overriding the essence of nothingness, forcing it to be its very antithesis. And as such, it does not remain comfortably, so to speak, in that state, and it constantly strains to revert to its, to its essence. So every something is constantly straining to revert into nothingness, because it wasn't always here. Every something that you see, by something I mean a created something, it wasn't always here. Look, you don't even have to believe in creation to believe that, even those who believe in a Big Bang. There might be other details we disagree about, but no one will say that creation was always here, that, that matter as we know it always existed. So the fact that it's here right now means it didn't used to be here, and now it's here. It wasn't made from other raw materials. It wasn't like the, the silver that you change into a cup, or flour that you change into dough, and dough that you change into bread. There were no raw materials. Nothingness were the raw materials, so to speak. You know, there's an old joke about this group of scientists. They want to show up God, and they want to show God that they can create just like, like God created during the six days of creation. Man is so advanced with his technology, we don't need God anymore. So they're going to recreate the creation of man from the book of Genesis. So what did they do? They, read, they were reading lines from Horatius, and they were following it. And the God formed the man uh, from the earth's four corners in the shape of a man. They had this mound of dirt, a mound of dirt in an anthropomorphic shape. And they had it hooked up to wires with electrodes. And, and, and he breathed into it the breath of life. So what did they do? They ran this current into it. They were going to run a current into it. And it was going to animate this mound of dirt. And the dirt is going to stand up and be a living, breathing, talking human being. Just like God took dirt and turned dirt into, into Adam, the first man. And that's they're going to show God that they can create. Just like God took dirt and made man. They're going to take dirt and make man. And they're about to flip the switch. It's going to animate that dirt and turn it into a man. And all of a sudden, a voice booms forth from heaven and says, Ah, not so fast. Get your own dirt. What's the joke? That even if they had successfully done it, that still wouldn't be creating. Because they're working with raw materials. They're working with dirt. The dirt already exists. Creation means that there is no dirt. There is no nothing. There, or there is nothing. There's no something. And you turn nothing into something. As such, every created being is essentially nothingness. And the only reason it continues to be a something is because God continues to compel it into that state. Or what he calls in chapter 2 of Shara Yechid Vamuna, Koyach tamid, the power or the 
the, uh, the force of the actor within the acted upon constantly. Okay. So, let, let's continue here and see how Rabbeinu Bechaya says it in, in less mystical language. But uh, he's nonetheless alluding to the, same, to the same idea, more or less. So people who don't understand how reality works, they think, that a created cause could actually cause change in things or transform them from one thing to another thing. However, that's impossible. Why? Because v'hasiba chalusha unekale mi'es mimena shinoi o'ichilof ba'atzmam. Because these causes are too weak. These created causes are too weak and insignificant to bring about change or transformation in the essence of things. A cause that it itself is created and doesn't even have any ontological independence. Fancy words, but it itself isn't even here um, in any unconditional way. It's, it, it itself is only being created something from nothing this second. So it doesn't have power to make things be. They themselves are somethings. So the best they can do is one something can act upon another something. You know, like... Uh, the, the metaphor the Alter Rebbe gives is, is, is the, the splitting of the sea. That you have the wind, which is a something, pushing on the water, which is another something, and making it stand up. But that's really just a superficial change. It's just a change in the form of water. That rather than being liquid and flowing, it's being pushed, it's being made to stand up. But that's not as miraculous as the fact that the water even exists in the first place. Because the water is being made something from nothing. <laughs> so to take one something and act upon another something and manipulate its form, that's not as, a big, as big of a deal as taking somethingness out of nothingness where you're overriding the essence of nothingness. So all these somethings can do is sort of bounce off of each other and act off of each other and, uh, and, and affect each other's superficial form. And even that, the only reason they're doing it is because they're being created that way at this second. They don't have, like I said, they don't have ontological independence. So they're not here on their own. If they're here, then every single second, it's only because God is creating them at this second. So they really have no independent power or influence at all. Okay, let's continue. Kasha Nire, okay, hold on, hold on one second, one second. Okay. Rebbeinu Bechaya is going to give us a metaphor or an example, an illustration to help us to wrap our minds around the idea of something from nothing. And as I've been explaining, the, the idea of yesh and something from nothing, is something that's elaborated upon at length in Chassidus. Here, Rabbeinu Bechayi gives a, a short but very effective philosophical um, example. Okay, continuing inside. When you see that a single grain of wheat produces 300 ears of wheat, Highly disproportionate yield. I mean, that's nature. That's what it generally does. What I'm saying is that the ratio that one little kernel of wheat, when you, when you plant that kernel of wheat and it grows, it grows 300 ears of, of wheat. Of a whole shibelis shleishim gagrim. And then each uh, of those 300 ears of wheat has within them 30 more seeds, like the original seed. So you have 300 times 30, you have 9,000. So from one planting, a single grain produced 9,000 grains. So one grain has caused close to 10,000 grains. The point is, this is not exactly something from nothing, but it's a pretty close approximation, or as close of an example as we can see in the physical universe. You know, there's ilava alul and there's yeshma'ain. Ilava alul is cause and effect. 
Okay, so you, you, you hit a ball with a bat, so the bat is one thing, the ball is another thing, and you, there's a clear cause and effect. You have one thing acting upon another thing, okay? Or wind blowing on water and making it stand up, okay? But then you have yesh ma'ayin, where the actor is not proportionate to the acted upon. To the extent that you even might you might even refer to the actor as nothingness because it's so insignificant, seemingly insignificant. It's actually the very opposite of insignificant, but appear it appears as nothing. It's one little grain, and yet its power is that it produces nine thousand grains. There's an old saying: anybody can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in a seed. So same type of idea here. How many grains are in a grain? So with one generation, there's 9,000 of them. And then and how many, and, and, and then obviously that number becomes exponential each time you go and you plant each, each crop or each yield, you replant it, so that number increases exponentially until very quickly you'll have numbers in, you know, with you know, absurdly large numbers, trillions, quadrillions, whatever, numbers that we can't, even, we can't even count. And it could all start from one grain. I mean, think about it, ostensibly in your lifetime, one grain that was planted when you were a child has grown how many, has produced how many grains through it, the generations, through each year of, of, of crops. You know, no, uh, like some type of number we couldn't even count, some, you know, uh, astronomical figure. And, and the point is that that's a glimpse or a glimmer of Yeshma'ayin, of how there can be something from nothing, how a, how a, how a tiny um, origin can produce this massive result. So that's almost like a something from nothing. Where did it come from? How? You, you can't fit that many grains. You can't fit 10,000 grains in one grain. So it didn't come from it in a sense of a cause and effect of a something from a something. The way it came from it is, is very akin to something from nothing. And we see this operating in the world. And it gives us a glimmer into the idea of something from nothing. This is what Rabbeinu Bechaya is saying. Okay, so he says, somebody who sees how, how uh, uh, one grain produces 9,000 grain, grains, Haye Oleim, can anyone fail to recognize that the force inherent in the grain is in, insufficient to produce such an amount? It's, it's not possible. So then how do you account for it? Also, not just, not just the, the, the wheat, but all types of plants that are planted, all types of seeds that grow. The same thing we say, same thing with a human being and other uh, animals, mitipas azera, from the original uh, seed, from the genetic material, one, one tiny cell. Or also like a big fish that grows from a tiny little egg. The point is, all of these are just examples of how you have something that is so tiny. It does not account for the result that it, that it yields. And the only way to understand it is that there's a power, a creative power, creative energy, which is a godly power, a godly energy in the universe that yields something from nothing. Okay, it's, it's, it's not like you took a piece of silver and you shaped it into a, into a cup. Or you took flour and you kneaded it into dough and you baked the dough and you turned it into bread. Those are all something from something, and the yield is proportionate. The yield is proportionate. But when you talk about growth, you know, reproduction, the growth is disproportionate. Okay, and especially when it talks about a human being, think about that. You take one cell, and from that, there's a human being with a life, and with a mind, and a personality, and, and, and a soul. That's, that's not an upgrade of twice, or ten times, or a thousand times, or even a billion times. It's really an infinite upgrade. And that's the power of infinity showing itself. When, when from one tiny little packet of DNA, from one cell, of, of a reproductive uh, cell, grows an entire human being, that can only be understood as something from nothing, as a godly power of, of, of infinity showing itself in the world. So anyone who will understand that that's how reality works He's not going to be able to think that some things have real power over other some things. 
really all the power is coming from the quote unquote nothing. Now it's not really nothing, not without getting into a whole discussion of Chassidus here. There's the Yesha Miti and the Yesha Nivra. And there's the Ayana Miti and the Ayana Nivra. From our perspective, the table is a something. Okay? So we call that a Yesh, but it's really only the Yesh HaNivra. Okay? And, and then we say that the, 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 the Koyach HaLaki, the godly power which brings the table into existence, relative to us, we call that Ayin, because we can't chart it and we can't relate to it, and it's just completely beyond our senses. So from our perspective, we call that Ayin, we call that nothingness. The truth is it's the exact opposite. That's the, the Yesh HaMiti, that's the real something. And the created beings are the are, the, are, are not really a yesh, they're the ayin amiti, the real ayin. Why are they ayin? Because they don't exist, chas v'shom, that's Buddhism. We don't say the world doesn't exist, but it's not ontologically independent. It doesn't exist for itself. It may have an existence, but not its own. It's borrowed existence, or it's the extension of God's existence. Okay, I told you this is going to be a deep class, so I hope everybody's following. Okay, let's continue inside. So therefore, let's get a little bit more practical. So preoccupying oneself, trying to advance what the created, may he be exalted, has delayed. Or to delay what he has advanced. Or to increase what he has decreased. Or to decrease what he has increased. From, from material acquisitions, from, from physical stuff. None of it makes sense. It's all futile. He says with a condition, with a caveat, unless it is in order to cause the performance of mitzvahs or service of Hashem and, uh, and learning Torah. Why, why is that caveat there? So the, Mar- the Marpa Lenefesh, one of the commentaries on Chavis uh, Lavavis, explains, because then you actually have Bechira. <laughs> Everything's in the hands of heaven except for one's awe of heaven. So, uh, you know, how the world conducts itself, we don't have any control. That's completely Hashem's control. But how we conduct ourselves, morally speaking, choosing right from wrong, ah, that Hashem leaves to us, we have complete control. So when it comes to something that's spiritual, um, Torah and Aveda, uh, then, then, and, and mitzvahs, then, then yes, then, we, then, then toil is not misplaced, it's not futile, it actually is well spent. But then go and figure, how much energy do we put trying to change material matters, and how much energy do we put trying to become you know, uh, spiritually refined, right? Kind of lopsided. At any rate, at any rate let's finish up. All of this, what we've been, been describing, is a weakness or a lack of recognition in the true knowledge of the, of the way things work. And, it, and it's foolishness and uh, it's a, a, an ignorance of understanding the goodness of how he conducts things. But it's all based on a on a misunderstanding of the nature of reality, or the nature of, of, of existence. Okay, let's, let's go a little bit further. Oh, yeah, I wanted to share one thing. So this is a sicha from Chelek Lamed Aleph Lakuti Sichas, it's a Purim sicha. But you see here, uh, in Eis Dalad, L'Yasser Bir Ubagdama, Rebbe is explaining a concept here. You do a mashamur chazal, the ain same chmalanes. You're not allowed to uh, rely on a miracle. Vahateira amra. Furthermore, Teira says, "Uvrecha Hashem aleikecha b'chol asher tase." Hashem will bless you in all that you do. Dafke, right? The af she birkas Hashem he sashir. Even though it is the blessing of Hashem which enriches. So which one is it? And we've spoken about this a little bit before. Which one is it? Is it that you've got to do it? Hashem will bless you if you put out effort? Or is it Hashem's blessing? And if it's Hashem's blessing, then why do you have to do anything? So we mentioned this before in an earlier class, but the Rebbe explains here in this Sicha how the only reason for the natural action that we put forth is to provide Hashem with plausible deniability. That really everything is from Shema Vaya. It's all miracles. 
It's all miraculous, but he doesn't want it to appear so. So we provide him with an alibi so that it can look, it can appear natural. But really, he's giving us everything as blessings, and all we're doing is um, working in order so it shouldn't appear that it's, it's a gift, that it's really, it's all bread from heaven. Okay, so therefore, what, what comes, what emerges from this? Somebody who toils, as, as Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar was talking about, someone who toils in trying to speed up what Hashem is delaying, or delay what Hashem is speeding up, or to increase what Hashem wants to decrease, or decrease what Hashem wants to increase, all that stuff is totally futile. And, and, and when it comes to making a living, the Rebbe says here, uh, an incredible mushal. Somebody who works harder in order to make money without realizing that that doesn't actually generate more income, and it's really only Hashem's blessing that, that, that generates income. What's it like? A person who works, who toils with, with great alacrity. Sewing wallets to put money into. But he doesn't have any plan for making the money itself. So everyone would know how foolish that is. So the Rebbe says that really somebody who works to try to make money by working harder without trying to increase his blessings from Hashem by increasing his connection to Hashem. It's like a guy who thinks he's got a money-making plan. He's going to sew a wallet. And by sewing the wallet and maybe sewing many wallets and sewing a really big wallet, he's going to get more money. He's just going to have a bunch of wallets, and they're all going to be empty. He's not going to have anything to put into them. Okay, so the same thing is, the work we do, maybe it creates a vessel to hold the blessing, but it doesn't create the blessing. It would be like creating a wallet, and the wallet is just empty. It doesn't have anything to put in it. All right. Let, let's, I'm, I know we're a little bit over time, but I'm just going to finish up this section, because it's just a good place to, to stop, Okay. And the wise man, that means Shleiman Melech, King Solomon, already alluded to this when he said, There's a time for everything, a moment for all concerns under the heavens. Then he cited 28 instances. This is what it says. There's a time for birth, a time for death. Ad Amr, until he says, Ace Melchama Ve Shalom, there's a time for war, there's a time for peace. Va Amr, ki Ace, Vafaga, Yikre, Es Kulam, and then he says, a time for calamity comes to them all. Va Amr, he says, ki Gavaya, me al Gavaya, Shemer, Gavaya Malayam, for a high one is watched by a higher one, and there, is, there are still higher ones over them. In other words, there's this complex system of causes and causes of causes and causes of causes of causes of causes. We have no way of understanding the complexity of the, I called it before in the last class, the Rube Goldberg machine. We have no way of understanding the complexity of the Rube Goldberg machine that Hashem is setting in motion, okay? The Creator's way of judgment are too hidden, too deep, too exalted for us to arrive at knowledge of their particulars, meaning even of the details, how much more so the, the big picture. The big picture is way beyond us. Ukvar Amar Akasov, this indeed is what the verse says, Ki gavu shamayim me'aretz, ken gavu drochayim me'drachaychem, mach shveisai, mach shveisaychem. That just as the heavens are higher than the earth, my, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, meaning it is beyond us to really plumb the depths of the system through which Hashem runs the world. The bottom line here is to know that there is nothing, nothing that is going to benefit us from trying to manipulate the different somethings in the world or to rely upon them, or to curry favor with them, or to line them up in a, some type of a favorable configuration. None of that does anything. Hashem is creating it all something from nothing, and He's in total control, and He's the only one who determines 
what things are going to be doing and when they're going to do them and how, how, that, how it's all going to happen. So it is futile to focus our efforts on the details of creating things and, and, and some things uh, that they themselves are only being created something from nothing every, every single second. And rather we should just focus um, in, on, one, on one source on, and on the only source of it all, which is truly in control at all times. Okay. Ah, oh, do Hashem's work, not trying to do His job, right? Yeah, that's one of my favorite ones. I do Hashem's work, not Hashem's job, right? What does it mean, do Hashem's work? Doing the Lord's work, acts of goodness and kindness, be good to Hashem, be good to His kids. That's, that's doing the Lord's work. What's trying to do His job? <laughs> Running the universe. That, that, that's His job. We don't do that. Okay, fine. Very good. Thank you for uh, coming along this very mystical and uh, challenging path tonight. Uh, with God's help, we'll be back tomorrow night for another lesson. Continuing chapter 3. Thank you.